going to look at what I call what the hell are we meant to eat now syndrome. Um, I think you're probably feeling a little bamboozled by what David just shared with you now and it's one of many, many issues that we all face when we just go to the supermarket or face a cafeteria menu each day. To discuss this particular malaise, we've got four very influential speakers on this next panel. David Gillespie, of course, Rosemary Stanton, Maggie Beer and Felice Jacker. This afternoon they'll be moderated by Mod Madonna King, who can only be described as a very well-known media personality. Here in Brisbane, you wake up to her on ABC Radio. Uh, she's also a regular columnist in the Courier Mail. She's a, been a visiting fellow at the uh, QUT, She's been on the board of the Walkleys and she's also written two books. Please welcome these people to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. We are what we eat. But just think, what did you have for breakfast this morning? What about last night for dinner? What did you drink with it? What about afternoon tea? What did you snack on? What might it say about you and could you be happier if you'd eaten something else. Our panellists, you've just heard from David Gillespie, author of the very popular book, Sweet Poison and the Sweet Poison Quit Plan. David, welcome back on stage. Pleasure. Dr. Rosemary Stanton won't agree with David Gillespie, and she's very well qualified, as you know. She's one of Australia's leading nutritionists, an honorary visiting fellow in the School of Medicine at the University of New South Wales. She's authored numerous scientific papers, 32 books on food and nutrition, and more than 3,500 newspaper and magazine articles. Rosemary, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Maggie Beer hardly needs an introduction. She's a... Oh, I was right, wasn't I? <laughs> but I'm going to give her one anyway. She's a culinary icon, a TV star. She's an author, a restaurateur, a food manufacturer, known for her classy, down-to-earth approach. And we're very lucky to have you on the panel this afternoon, Thank Maggie. You, <laughs> and finally, Dr. Felice Jacker, an NH and MRC research fellow at Deakin University. Now, Dr. Jacker has published some of the first articles worldwide concerning the association between diet quality and depression in adolescents and adults. Dr. Jacker, thank you. So let's start here. Maggie Beer, if you were going to make someone happy, what would you serve them? Well, first of all, I'd have them for dinner in my kitchen and I would we're in um, June right now, so I'd take some rapini out of the garden, a beautiful green. Um, I'd have some parsnips, and I'd have a beautiful but well brought up chook, and that'd be all roasting in the oven, really nice and slowly, so it can have a resting period. And while that's happening, I would have my guests around me, helping me to do the, um, the, the starters, which might be some beautiful bread as a bruschetta, properly done, you know, on the grill and then rubbed with garlic and then extra virgin olive oil, perhaps a little bit of mushroom pate <laughs> and, and a bit of goat's cheese and a drizzle of um, oil to finish. And, ah, for dessert. <sighs> for dessert, I will have a little crumble um, of rhubarb baked with a little orange juice and a tiny bit of brown sugar, <laughs> and and I'll use butter and and um, fresh uh, no um, some ginger and um, brown sugar again for the crumble and cream. Stop. Um, <laughs> cream. Oh, yes. Jersey okay. cream. Okay, let's stop there. <laughs> Hands up if you can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go to David, I'm going to go to nutritionist Dr. Rosemary Stanton. Is Maggie Beer on the right track? Look, I think she really is, as long as her portions aren't too big. Yes. And I, I, would, I would go out in the garden and pick a lot of that stuff yes. for Maggie. And in fact, yes. I have been in your yes. kitchen, Maggie, yes. and I have helped to prepare the food. But as long as you get the rhubarb out of the garden absolutely. and the greens out of the garden and yes. all that, I think it's absolutely fine. Mm. David okay. Gillespie, the food you serve would not contain any sugar, no. and we'll get to that in just a moment, <laughs> but what would it contain? Well, probably loads of the stuff that we're told not to eat, you know, butter, some of the things that Maggie was talking about, loads of cream, some butter, a bit of bacon, bacon fat, you know, leave the fat on. In fact, I if I had to serve something to make people happy, every morning I serve something to make six people happy, which is our kids, 
and uh, it usually consists of something involving cooking bacon and or sausages. Dr. Felice Jacker, sausages uh, David just brought up. What do you think here? In terms of meat, how, is there any research that shows whether meat is a good thing or a bad thing? Well, really surprisingly, um, it was certainly surprising really to me because I grew up as a vegetarian and I um, was a vegetarian for a very, most of my adulthood. Uh, my recent data does suggest that women who eat the recommended amount of meat, which is not a huge amount, but it's a small serving three or four times a week, seem to have half the likelihood of having either depressive or anxiety disorders than those who eat either not enough or too much. Well and that was really surprising. This is new, very new data, hasn't been published yet, and of course it needs to be replicated in other uh, data sets, but it was a very interesting and a very clear and very consistent finding. We'll come back to that in just a moment, mm. if I, I may, but that leads us into your quite significant research. You have looked at how food can make someone unhappy, the effect uh, of food on depression and anxiety in women specifically. Just explain what that found. Well, our research looked at women who were very representative of the Australian female population right across the age range from a wide range of backgrounds. And we looked at the quality of their diets in various different ways. And we also looked at their clinical depressive and anxiety disorders and also their symptoms. And we found very clear relationships between the two. So the women who had better quality diets were much less likely to have depressive or anxiety disorders. They also had uh, lower symptom scores. On the other hand, the women whose diets were more um, processed and, and full of refined uh, sugars and saturated fats and processed foods, they were more likely to be depressed. And we've since found a very similar patterns of association in adolescence as well. And of course, the, the scientific community and the psychiatric research community were quite surprised and excited about all of this. But of, when I speak to the general public, their reaction is, well, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> we know. <laughs> all right, let's just come back to what you said about the very early research on, on meat. To Rosemary Stanton, yep. you don't eat a lot of meat for a couple of reasons. One of those is nutritionally you think it has limits? Yeah, I would actually like David to read the World Cancer Research Fund's reports. Uh, the latest one which came out in May shows that the link between processed meats and very fatty meats is now, it's now gone from being probable in the first studies to convincing to now strong evidence for colorectal cancer, for bowel cancer. So having worked in the area of bowel cancer for many years, I think we need to keep the amount of meat small. And Felice was talking about small serves. And by small serves in Australia, what we mean is 65 to 100 grams three to four times a week. That's a very small portion. It's not... 65 grams, show it's me. It's very little. I mean, you know, tiny little piece. It's not much at all. I don't have a problem with that. I don't eat beef and pork unless I know where, that, where it came from. Mm -hmm. And that's my, my feeling about uh, those meats in particular. Uh, but I, I don't have a problem with people eating small amounts of meat, but I think large amounts of meat are priming us for, for the one of the really worst cancers that we have in this country for, for certain incidents, which is colorectal cancer. So is there a perfect diet? There's no perfect diet for any person. I hate diets. I really hate diets. I, I actually think if we followed the sort of philosophy of somebody like Michael Pollan, who says, eat real foods, mostly plants, not too much. That to me is the way to eat. But I don't like the thought that we have a diet. I've never written a diet. I'm never going to write a diet. The only thing I write about diets is why they're all crazy and where they're <laughs> wrong. Uh, because I really think that we just need to get back to eating real food mm. in appropriate quantities and stop all this silly business that everyone has to be the same size and everyone has to go on a diet. All right, we'll come back to diets in a moment too, but we're talking about whether there's a perfect meal plan, I guess. How yeah. much sugar would be in that? Well, I guess for sugar, I mean, I actually do agree with David that we eat far too much sugar. I mean, I've been, you know, the... I've had the death threats and everything from the sugar industry over the last 45 years that I've been saying this, but I just don't think we need to have none. I just think we need a small amount. And the studies basically show, and the World Health Organization says, that if sugar doesn't make up more than probably 5 to 10% of your daily calories, which is about half of what a, a, a sort of a reasonable Australian eats and about a quarter of what a big sugar eater eats, uh, then I, that's just small amounts. So there's enough for Maggie's crumble. Uh, Thank you. There's enough Thank you. sugar to put I'm on saved. top of your porridge in the morning, you know, but there's not enough 
to go around eating breakfast cereals where a third of what you pour out is sugar. That's You're going to ask whether you can have a second piece of crumble. <laughs> no, not, not at all. I don't have a sweet tooth. <laughs> I just had to put it in for <laughs> to get it, David. Well, look, you know, I go to David here. David, you say no sugar, but and we all nod our heads, but nobody does that. Nobody lives that way, do they? They don't now. Um, it, it's actually really difficult to do now if you're going to eat processed food. Um, well, let's if, not eat if, processed if, food. If you are going to eat processed <laughs> food, it's very difficult to do. Mm. If, however, you shop the perimeter of the supermarket, so fruit, veg, meat, dairy, milk, eggs, all of those things are sugar-free except for the fruit, and the fruit comes with a package of fibre that um, mitigates the damage being done by the fructose. So if you stay away from the centre of the supermarket, you can live sugar-free, and you're not eating a bizarre diet. So is the difference between you and Rosemary that, Rosemary, you would think it's quite dangerous to send out a message that, for example, children should not eat fruit? I think that's a very dangerous message, and I think that the science on fructose is not quite as clear-cut as David makes out. I certainly agree that we need much less sugar in our diets generally, but this whole sort of pushing on one particular type of sugar uh, where you can cherry pick the bits out of any sort of research that you want. And when I read the whole of the research, it really isn't there in that way. So it's a, a question of quantity as much as anything, because I basically would like people to eat far fewer processed foods. We've probably all agreed on that. Oh, aren't we? Agreement on the yes, no. uh, processed mm. foods and the fast foods and the junk sort of stuff. I mean, and and you would also agree with David, let's say breakfast cereal, I think you say, David, could be one third sugar. Yes. Yeah. Well, a lot of them are and one third sugar. And have a heart foundation tick on it. Absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> but what it's does ridiculous. that mean? <laughs> well, the heart foundation tick goes on products that contain more salt than the products than the similar soups. Mm. Without the product, mm. I could go into that. All right, so, so <laughs> Maggie, <laughs> you want to say something? Well, but not everyone um, has a diet of processed foods. You know, I know a percentage of the population does, but there's a very strong percentage that revels in gardening and going to the, um, ga uh, the, the local markets. They really love food. And, and that's and they probably don't eat much sugar. And they don't eat <laughs> yeah, much sugar, right. really. Yeah. And and it's so easy to do, and it's so beautiful and full of flavour. Why would you want processed food? Well, because it's not about being time poor. Sorry, yes. it's mm. not about being time poor. Because if you if you know what you're doing with food, if you have um, knowledge about it, that's very easily uh, obtained. You can cook in 15 minutes mm. something that is lovely on the table. Mm. Well, that's exactly right, Maggie. Mm. I mean. If, if you eat sugar, you know because you put it there. Yes, <laughs> yes um, that's right. Whereas like in the crumble. For, for a lot of people mm. in Australia today, uh -huh. they're eating a lot of sugar that they don't even know is there. True. Now, I know Rosemary Stanton doesn't like the idea of, of people on diets. And do you know what percentage of the population would be on a diet at any one time? I don't think we know, but we could probably have a fair sort of guess from the amount of diets in magazines and okay. on late night television programs and all those sort of things that it's a fair percentage of women probably more than half try diets and when we look at teenage girls it's fairly shocking that they try these sort of silly diets. I guess one of the things that I, I don't like about diets and I don't like about blaming fructose is people are always looking for the magic bullet yeah. and there Aren't is we? no magic yeah. bullet and you get the same thing when people look for superfoods. People say to me what, what are superfoods? I think all of the good foods are superfoods. This whole idea that we have to have particular foods that we say are extra good and some foods that we blame, that we can blame all of the weight problems on, on fructose. I just think it's an extreme position and we need to stop looking for single scapegoats. Or all single right, let's come back to superfoods in, in just a moment because we're told constantly there are. But just to finish with, with you, David, on, on this point, a lot of people are on diets. I seem to be on one every second week. If you could go to the gym for 40 minutes a day, five days a week, or stop all sugar, what would you say would lose the most weight? Stop all sugar. Going to the gym, you'll stay the same weight, unless you also modify your diet. Mm, um, that's right. the, the important thing about what I'm saying is it's not a diet. If it was a diet, I couldn't do it. If it required willpower, I couldn't do it. Um, because I tried hundreds of diets and couldn't. Um, it is about simply removing the thing that messes with your appetite control and then eating in accordance with what your body tells you to eat. Of course, when you cut down on sugar like that, you also cut down on fat because very few people sit down to a bowl of sugar. Uh, yep. And sure, if you're just having a drink, and that's another totally different topic of liquid oh, we'll calories. Oh, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's course, right liquid afternoon. calories are a problem. <laughs> but if you look at many, much of the sugar we eat 
it, it makes the biscuits and the cakes and the desserts and a lot of the confectionery taste good. You wouldn't eat them if they didn't have the sugar. So you're getting sugar and fat together. And I think to just isolate the sugar is probably wrong. Maggie? Well, not even um, commercially made food has to have a lot of sugar. It has to have some. But if you, you know, if you feel really strongly about flavour, you want, and you're making an ice cream, you want the fruit to dominate, not the sugar. But a lot of traditional food ask for much more sugar. So don't trust any recipe that asks for a lot of sugar. Use your own um, uh, palate as your guide. All right. Uh, uh, Rosemary has destroyed the idea that there's these superfoods <laughs> we could rely on. But, but Maggie Beer, can I ask you if there were three foods that you could rely on, what would they be? Rely on or can't live without? Can't live without. Um, extra virgin olive oil, mm -hmm. um, Australian. Um, it's got to be number one. Um, can't live without. Oh, I not but oh no butter um, butter, <laughs> butter. butter. <laughs> butter. Yeah. and um, and good salt good salt it, and good pepper sorry that's four right, so you can have four you <laughs> yes. can have four but australian pepper australian salt you know using what is in our environment and using what is being grown here but they are the 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 you know that adding that extra little bit to food Rosemary, I thought you would have said blueberries, strawberries, yeah. and because oh, that's what we taught. I probably would say fruit. I mean, my favourite foods, if I start listing them, passion fruit, raspberries, perfect white peaches. Yeah. I mean, they're all, yeah. they all happen to be fruits, as it happens. Maybe I don't yeah. like sweet things. Um, I'd yeah. probably put the ice cream in there somewhere as well. But I think when we're looking at the foods that I feel deprived if I don't get my veggies, when I'm travelling and I don't get veggies mm, and I come home, true. what I want is a yeah. huge plate out of my yeah. garden of lovely vegetables. Yeah. So for me, I have to have vegetables, but I do want a bit of your extra virgin <laughs> olive oil <laughs> on them. All right, well, let's move on to meal as an experience because, uh, Maggie, you raised this briefly a few minutes ago. Let's talk about non-food elements here. How important is, is music, lighting, organic foods, help in preparing? Well, to me, music is incredibly important. Um, it's all the first thing, no, the second thing, the coffee machine and then a ABC FM in the morning. <laughs> um, so music, uh, it just feeds my soul. Um, uh, but really, uh, that feeling of warmth that doesn't have to come from heating, but that comes from the people around you, that's the really important thing. Can I ask you, if, can you just raise your hand if you do take the phone off the hook at meal times. Raise your hand if you don't, if you don't take the phone off the, the hook. <laughs> okay, can I ask the, our panelists? Yeah, no, okay, don't. so <laughs> so the phone stays on. I would have thought, Maggie, if you were developing an environment, children around the table, people helping, the last thing you want is the mobile going off. Oh, no, no, the mobile wouldn't be on, oh. but, but the home phone, no one has it. <laughs> 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 so I don't bother to turn it off, it's only family. <laughs> Um, just, just on that environment, Do Dr. Felice Jacky, you're being a bit quiet. Can I ask you this? Children, teenagers aren't eating as well as they used to. Why? Well, there's obviously a lot of reasons for that. I think the predominance of the processed food industry, it's ubiquitous, it's very, very powerful, it's very persuasive. Um, but also, you know, more parents, are, both parents are in the workforce, so we're somewhat time poor. And I think it's, a, it's, it's just a cultural thing. We've lost touch with uh, the whole process of growing and preparing fresh food. And this is where I think, you know, Stephanie Alexander's gardens and those sorts of things are so critically important. Well, Maggie Beer, you, you feature on reality TV shows. Could that turn Dr Jacker's concern around that we've got six-year-olds, seven-year-olds <coughs> wanting to play in the kitchen, learn to cook? I, I think absolutely, because it's... It's made everyone interested in food, talking about food, and whole families, and and having and having a go at food that they might not ever uh, usually be introduced to. And so that that thing about this is food for children has gone mm. from those that are avid watchers of, of something like Master Chef. I just want to add to that. Um, mm. One of the things that we noticed in our family from eliminating sugar is that if we wanted a treat, we had to make it from scratch. We could, couldn't <laughs> buy it. Uh -uh. Um, and what we use instead of sugar is just the glucose half of the sugar, um, so glucose, and which is nowhere near as sweet as sugar, but doesn't have to be. But if you have to make it from scratch, uh -huh. then that does involve the kids, and it does involve them in preparing rather than merely assembling 
Rosemary Stanton, yeah. true or false, you have to get a child to try something seven or eight times, let's say broccoli, before they get accustomed to the taste. Some children are like that, and they're the, they tend to be the super tasters, and so they taste the bitter flavour much more. And they need to taste the food, the studies show, eight to ten times before they actually can accept it. But I think it's important they do that at the table. So I see it as incredibly important that families sit together at the table. I'm appalled at the fact that 30% of kids live in homes where there is no dinner. They get themselves something to eat and take it to their room mostly. Now, to me, the whole idea of sharing food is extremely important. I see it as just as important as the nutrition. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have the research that shows that. So with little kids, their language development is much better if they eat with adults. With older kids, they are much less likely to get into trouble with the law, to start smoking, to start drinking early, to start using drugs. All of those things, when you account for all the socioeconomic factors and get those confounders out of the way, you find that the family that eats together has better results with the kids. We're here in five years' time in the exact same positions. <laughs> Maggie Beer, is it fair to say you believe we will go back to simply prepared, seasonally driven food? I hope so. That's really my hope for Australians, that we really understand what we have uh, and, and, and use it and have the confidence to use it. That's the one thing that I see missing in this equation. David Gillespie, do you think as a nation we will be eating more or less sugar? I hope we'll be eating a lot less. Um, I think I have a vision very similar to Maggie's, which is people knowing what's in their food and choosing either to put the sugar there or not put it there. Uh, Dr. Jackie, you would be hoping teenagers would eat less processed food, eat, eat more healthily? Well, children and teenagers, because um, you know we know that the average age of onset of the depression and anxiety is very young, it's in very early adolescence. And I think that it's so incredibly important that kids and adolescents get the very nutrient-dense foods into them at such a critical stage when they're growing and developing. I, I believe that it will have an impact on brain development and potentially on the prevalence of these highly prevalent disorders in the community. Mm. Rosemary Stanton, would we be eating food that... Uh creates minimal environmental damage? Will that become more or less important? Well, I would certainly hope that too. And I think we can manipulate these things and we can mani manipulate it through price. We can, first of all, I'm not retiring till I get rid of ads directed at kids. It's time for the kids <laughs> to watch it. I'm, I'm not, I, sh <laughs> I, I should have retired years ago and I'm still here and I'm not going, and I'm not going till we get the percentage of sugar on the packet. Uh, and I also want the trans fats out of the food. So I've got a list of things. If the food industry wants to get rid of me, they've just got to tick them off. All right, well, look, let's put it into practice now. We've got a couple of minutes left. It's Friday night in Brisbane. Let's say everyone's coming to my place for dinner. Let's develop the perfect meal. Entree, main course. David Gillespie, you're going to get to serve dessert. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jacker, you can choose whether we have alcohol or not alcohol, but I'd like to show you my cellar. <laughs> Let's start. Maggie Beer, what would we have for entree? Okay, well, right at the moment, here in Queensland, your avocados are full of, well, some of the varieties, full of the most perfect oil. They're the perfect food for me. And so I'd chop that up um, and I'd, I'd cook some lentils in some chicken stock and lots of fresh herbs and the cold avocado in t on top of the warm lentils. And that would be entree with extra virgin olive oil at the last <laughs> moment. <laughs> David, I kept her away from the crumble. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary Stanton, main I could main just about course. have a bigger serve of, of uh, <laughs> that for my main course. But look, uh, mm. I want some vegetables in my main course and I want them made interesting with extra virgin olive oil, some nice herbs, whatever's fresh in the garden. And I, I really want to get some nuts in there somewhere because they are environmentally very sustainable to grow and eat nuts. They are nutritionally wonderful and they taste fantastic. Mm. So I want some nuts on my vegetables. Now, as and I've mentioned the vegetables first for a reason because I think I want to think about the vegetables more than I want to think about the meat, fish, mm. chicken, mm or whatever, I'd probably go for some sort of um, fish, and I want a sustainable fish, and there are some in Australia, so I want some sustainable fish. And I, I won't go into all the cooking details because we'll run out of time, but I, I want the vegetables to take up at least half of the plate and then the, the piece of fish. And you can have, I don't mind if you have some couscous or But we want to taste this, or, yeah, pick Yeah, the we fish. want to sort of um, taste it. Well, I, I'm probably going to do the fish on my barbecue, lots of fresh herbs out of the garden, 
bit of extra virgin olive oil, some lemon juice, something very simple for my lovely fish. Sounds lovely. David Gillespie, we've had main course. Yep. And, and a beautiful entree and main. Um, if you've got a functioning appetite control system because you deleted sugar, you won't have room for the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, He's a lawyer. But just in case, just in case you, you, you hadn't eaten for a week or something, then um, maybe a nice cheese platter. You know, it's a nice mix oh. of uh, lovely cheeses. It'd be beautiful. I think my appetite, if I didn't have appetite for dessert, I wouldn't be able to fit the cheese in. <laughs> That's oh, lunch. Well, we're going to stick with cheese platters, some nuts on the side. Nuts on the side, just okay. no dried fruit. And uh, Dr. Felice Jacker, do we go to the fridge? Is it soft drink? Is it juice? Is it water? Is it a red wine, a white wine? If, if there were kids, it would only be water. Yes. It's absolutely paramount, I think. Um, I think it's the drinks that are really problematic at this stage. Mm. For, for adults, I would suggest... If there was some red meat in, in the, uh, the meal, and I should specify that the red meat I was talking about earlier was beef and lamb, which in Australia generally come from grass-fed animals, and that's really important that they're not coming from grain-fed animals. But the red wine helps to uh, offset some of the oxidative damage that red meat can do. And it does it directly in the stomach. So you drink red wine, it goes in, it sits on the red meat in the stomach and so neutralises it. You're suggesting we open a bottle of red wine? Absolutely. One glass or two? One bottle will do for the lot of us. Excuse me, Maggie. I think I'd glass. say two. <laughs> Maggie, would you join me in a second bottle? Yeah. A second glass? <laughs> a second glass. <laughs> second glass. <laughs> Let's do a second bottle, thank you. And I think we can all drink to that. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, dear.